Tim from the Mouse Castle here, and I'm drinking wine because I can. As there were no objections from the last time we did this, none I've chosen to acknowledge anyway, I'm back with another installment of Inside, Inside the, the Mouse, Mouse Castle. Castle. Today we're spending time with my good friends from Mice Chat, one of the premier Disney news and message board sites on the internet. Last month, they celebrated their 7th anniversary with a huge member meet at Disneyland, the highlight of which was a breakfast at the ESPN Zone in downtown Disney. The restaurant was packed with enthusiastic mice chatters eager to meet an esteemed panel of Disney celebrities, take some pictures, and snag a few autographs too. There were great stories, a ton of laughs, and bacon. Lots of bacon. Seriously, the bacon at ESPN Zone totally rocks. Mice Chat has grown substantially during its seven years of existence. It began as a spin-off of Al Lutz's Mice Age news site and now boasts over 49,000 registered members and an insane amount of visitor traffic. At the anniversary breakfast, I had time to speak to Mice Chat's administrator and driving force, the venerable Dusty Sage. Could you have imagined seven years ago when you launched Mice Chat that it would be the type of site that it is today? No, uh, it's overwhelming. Um, very emotional for me when I even think about it. You know, we started uh, seven years ago and it was just to start a forum for Al Lutz's Mice Age site um, because he didn't have one and uh, the community grew so rapidly and in seven years uh, Mice Chat's really grown to be larger than all the other Disneyland centric uh, fan sites combined uh, as far as uh, page views go. Uh, we had almost 50 million page views last year, which is mind-boggling um, and certainly not something we originally set out to do. Uh, we just wanted to have a place for friends to get together and chat about their love of Disneyland and you know, look, look at what it's become. You know, we've got people that have met and married and had babies and I've been to weddings and been best man and I'm godfather to little mice babies. <laughs> and even uh, attended, you know, the, the funerals of dear friends who we met also through Mice Chat. So it's really become an entire ecosystem and um, certainly not what we set out to do initially. A lot of events going on this weekend and I've been coming to these uh, events for I think six of your seven anniversary years and uh, a lot of special guests today. Uh, talk about uh, some of the some of the cool people that we're getting to see today. Well, uh, last year we had uh, the very first president of Disneyland, Jack Linquist. And that was a pretty neat event for us. And Jack had a new book out, and he's a big fan of Mice Chat and of the parks and liked to, to meet people. He had no idea that he had fans, but he does. He has a huge fan base. And that event went so well that people started asking, oh, what are you going to do for next year's event? And I thought, oh my gosh, what could I possibly do to, you know, follow up on that event and started making some calls and it turns out there are you know plenty of people out there in the Disney ecosystem who heard of us and were willing to come in fact Bob Gurr was was really excited to meet with his fans and he's another one you know they were Imagineers at a time when there really weren't Disney fans and now that they are no longer Imagineers discovering that wow, they actually have a following of people who know what they've done. And so these kind of events allow them to connect and it gives them a great feeling as much as it is for us fans to come and see our heroes. So this event today really worked out for everyone. So we had Margaret Carey, um, who was the original um, artist sketch model for Tinkerbell, um, amazing personality. And she blew us away today with her story. She was hysterical, uh, so much heart and soul. And we had Susan Egan, who was Broadway's Belle and uh, Meg from Hercules and she is adorable and so many people today fell in love with her and she is also a local girl so um, she's been reading the site all this time I had no idea that we had Disney celebrities that have been reading us and uh, Sam Genoway and um, it was just a spectacular event so we'll have to see what we're able to cobble together for next year but hopefully we won't run out of celebrities I don't think you will there's a lot of them out there and uh, just a great lineup today and uh, this is really kind of setting up too. you talked about it earlier uh, of a big event that we're gonna do at next year's meet because it's not just the eighth anniversary of mice shed is it it isn't um, next year will be the 10th anniversary of mice age and mice age is really the um, 
the heart of our community in many ways because Al Lutz has given us so much information about the Disney parks and how they really run. And if it weren't for Al Lutz, I never would have thought to bring together the community of Mice Chat. And so we really want to honor Al next year and Mice Age and the entire Disney fan community and do an amazing year of events for Mice Age's 10th anniversary. So everyone will need to stick around and see what we have planned. That's very exciting. I'm looking forward to it. Congratulations on seven years and here's to many years more. Thank you so much, Tim. Sam Genoway is an accomplished Disney historian and author. His blog, Samland, is a must-read for anyone who appreciates Disney history. Sam's written a new book, Walt and the Promise of Progress City. It's a book that takes a look at a side of Walt Disney not often explored. We don't see Walt Disney the animator, filmmaker, or television host. We see Walt Disney the urban planner, who spent the better part of his life creating cutting-edge three-dimensional spaces. From his Burbank studio, to Disneyland, to numerous projects on the drawing board at the time of his death. One of his most ambitious projects was Epcot. Not the perpetual World's Fair we know at Walt Disney World today, but an experimental prototype community of tomorrow. A self-sustaining, utopian community incorporating the latest in technology. Given what Epcot Center has become today, with its Future World and World Showcase components, I asked Sam if Walt's original vision of Epcot would have really been viable today. You know, I've done a lot of research about the topic and where the book kind of really had started from was I, I kind of started as a, I'm an urban planner by background, that's my training. And I kind of approached it as a feasibility study, looking at what the plans were proposed and then trying to work backwards to the various components to see if whether they added up and whether the thing would have worked. And I, I've got to say that after all the research that I've done, I spent a number of hours with Harrison Buzz Price prior to his death and talked to him about the project. And he was very intimate in the economics of the project and have come to the conclusion that if the Disney company had the nerve to move forward with Walt's vision, it would have been a very, very tough, hard project, but at the end, I think it not only would have worked, but would have even exceeded the success of Walt Disney World as we know it today. Walt truly, just like he did with Disneyland and many of the other things that he had done, he truly knew a timeless quality of building that would have created a place that would have emotionally connected to us that would have been unlike anything else on earth and and the project itself was more evolutionary not revolutionary he took the best ideas that already existed and he just happened to package them in such a way where it would have truly been something unique looking but it was all based on really good urban planning principles and that's what the book does it talks a lot about Walt's interest but it also is a bit of an education about urban planning urban planning concepts and why and how our cities are designed the way they are. Uh, Walt Disney's plan for Mineral King was kind of a far-flung departure from the average ski resort, wasn't it? Oh my, yes. Can you imagine? You drive up to a little town called Silver City. You park your car in a big giant parking garage that's underground that's heated. You hop on an electric cog railroad that takes you down into this pristine valley onto a small little village that looked like it was straight out of Switzerland and only took a small portion of the valley floor. Much of the valley floor was left open. You would have looked up into space and you would have looked at these beautiful bowls, ski bowls, all the way around the valley. And you wouldn't be able to see the, the ski lifts because they would have been camouflaged. The project would have been more successful even in the summer. Walt expected more visitors in the summer to a ski resort than he did in the winter. So it was going to be a truly different kind of place. And it would have been the only ski resort designed specifically for families. Hence the reason the Country Bear Jamboree was going to be in the main lodge. Because Walt knew that kids wouldn't be hanging out at the bar like they're adults. They had to have something to do. And so he thought a, a show about singing bears would be the right thing to have at a mountain resort. It would have been absolutely fabulous. Now, whether it should have been in the Mineral King the valley in the middle of the Sierra Nevada mountains and all the politics that were involved. Ah, that's a good discussion to have. Don't have an answer for you on that one though. Yeah, that was that was a project that uh, never never came uh, came through uh, because of environmental issues, because of politics. What were some of the obstacles that they ran into that finally quashed the plan? Well, for a lot of us, the project is a lot more important than we even imagine. It was how we established environmental impact report law in the United States, and that was what ultimately did the project in. The project was much bigger than what the Forest Service had originally proposed for Mineral King. The Sierra Club saw the size of the project and. Ultimately 
ultimately became afraid that it would destroy the very fragile valley that was going to be set in. The court case went all the way up to the Supreme Court and it established today the reason why we have to do environmental impact reports on projects. So it was very, very important to what we do even today. Uh, I, I just think that the, 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 what Walt had, his vision for this, the fact that he wanted to build a ski resort really for his family, something his family would really enjoy. The same motivation as Marty Scalar said that he had for Disneyland, he would have applied that to this mountain retreat and it would have been unlike anything that you ever would have seen. Well, you've been uh, covering Disney history for a long time. How did you first get interested in, in Disney? Well, you know, I chronicle, I chronicle that a little bit in the book itself. Uh, I'm of the age, about the size of the age of the Matterhorn. You guys figure out the math, okay? <laughs> I'm as old as a mountain. And uh, at, at the time, there was uh, uh, there was an event. Uh, Jack Lindquist, who in fact did this breakfast event last year, he told this story about this phenomena of mothers bringing their little kids to Disneyland and just letting them run around. This was in the day where it was pretty inexpensive to buy a ticket to get in the park. If you didn't buy tickets to the rides and you didn't buy uh, any food, it was actually pretty cheap to come to Disneyland. We lived in Whittier. My mom used to be me and my older brothers. She would let them run around and then I would hang out with her. Well, we didn't go on any of the rides, but we did do the free rides and that did include Carousel of Progress. So I went on Carousel of Progress endlessly as a little boy. I was of just the right age that when you went to the Progress City model that was upstairs, a 6,900 square foot model, you just looked at the thing and you go, what a model. I wonder if this could really happen. I have been asking that question my entire life. And so one day I sat down and I thought, I wonder if you could have actually built that city that was represented in that model. And hence the book, Walt and the Promise of Progress City. It did help going to school and becoming trained as an urban planner. At least I was able to ask the right questions. But I have always been fascinated about the place. I've always wanted to learn why it is that it touches us so emotionally. And one thing I hope that the book does for the reader is, you who are hardcore Disney fans, and you're always going to the park and your friends are asking, you're going to Disneyland again? You're going to Walt Disney World again? Why don't you go do something different? I try to answer the question as to why these parks touch us so emotionally, why they keep bringing us back. What is it about the design of the urban space that touches us the way that it does? And that's one of the questions I try to answer in the book. Fantastic. Well, it's a fascinating book. And if people want to buy it, where, where can they uh, order it? Uh, it's uh, easily available on Amazon. You can buy both a paperback version. There's also a Kindle version. It is sold at the Walt Disney Family Museum bookstore, Romans in Pasadena, and some other bookstores around the country. Fantastic. Well, thanks a lot, Sam. Appreciate your time. Thank you. And that's what's on my mind inside the Mouse Castle. When next we meet, I'll have part two of my coverage of Mice Chat's seventh anniversary with a very fun interview with Margaret Carey, the original live action model for Disney's Tinkerbell. Be sure to check out the latest news and commentary on themousecastle.com and follow me on Facebook and Twitter. I'm also on Google Plus because, well, somebody had to. Take care.